We're seeing Jesus on the cross. He's paying for the sins of the world. And I want you to think about this. For the Jews, they're killing a problem. For the Romans, they're trying to satisfy the Jews. But for us, we see God's love for the entire world to send us the Savior who would die and rise again, providing the way of salvation. We're seeing one of the greatest events in all of history. Jesus Christ dying on the cross to save to save mankind, to provide the way of salvation. In one sense, it's horrible because we see him suffering and separation from the Father. In the other sense, we say, boy, it is so amazing that he's being our substitute. He's dying for us. Last week, we saw the first of the seven statements of Jesus Christ on the cross. Now, as we go through the Gospel of Matthew, we're seeing him dying on the cross, but we're going to have to go to the different Gospels to see all seven statements that Jesus Christ made. We saw the first one last week, and this week we're going to see two more. And one of them he's going to talk about for a robber. He says, today you'll be me in paradise. He says, paradise for the robber. What did he mean? And then the, one, the other one, the other statement is to his mother and to John. And so we'll see so much as we go through our passage this morning. Well, let me ask you a question. You ever been misunderstood? I'm sure the answer, of course, is yes. I mean, we did something, we meant it to be one way and it turned another way, or we said something that went the wrong way, and somehow you can't explain it, and you say, gosh, they, I'm just misunderstood. I've told this story before, but Chuck Swindoll tells the story of a, a friend that he had who was a lawyer in Dallas, and he was a single man. He was in his early 30s, and every year at Thanksgiving, the partner would come in and give all of the lawyers a turkey to take home. Well, he was a single man, and he, he really couldn't use a turkey, and, but every year he got one, and of course, all the other guys kind of made fun of him. So one year, what they did is they took his turkey before he got it, they swapped it out, they made some cardboard thing, they put some weight in it, and it looked like a turkey. And so when he got his turkey, he thought, well, I got my turkey. And so as he on the way home, he uh, boarded, a, you know, a bus that he would take home, like a, you know, one of those things, and, and as he was traveling, he looks over, and he sees a man who looks pretty pitiful, and they started talking, and the man told him that he was a Christian, and that he just lost his job, and he had three children, and it was Thanksgiving, and he had no money or anything, and so the friend says, look, I've got a turkey. I never use it. This is a turkey they give me every year. I never use it. Let me give it to you, and the guy said, no, I can't take it. I can't take a handout. He said, let me give it to you. The guy said, well, I have a dollar fifty, and the guy said, okay, give me your dollar fifty. I'll give you the turkey, so he got that, and then he, he thought, wow, this is amazing. Somebody could use that turkey. Well, the next Monday when they all got back to work, all the guys started saying, how did you like your turkey? And he said, well, I, I actually gave it away. And they went, what? And then they began to tell him what happened. And all of a sudden he realized that he had get, taken a man's final dollar fifty, who had no job and three kids and basically told him it was a turkey when it really wasn't. And so it said for the next four, five, six weeks, he would take the same bus every, every evening going home, seeing if he could find that man, but he never found him. And he thought, you know, he was really missing. He, that, that guy probably thought, you really are a jerk. You took my last money and you gave me a false turkey. Well, some, you know, he was misunderstood. And sometimes that happens to us. Well, you know, this morning we're going to see the religious leaders and the people, they misunderstand what Jesus is doing. They're saying things like, if you're the Son of God, come down from that cross. If God's really for you, come down the cross. They don't understand. They're misunderstanding what he's doing. He's dying on the cross to pay for the sins of mankind. They misunderstand what he is doing. So as we begin this morning, we're going to see Jesus dying on the cross. If you remember, we, he's already gone through six trials, three before the Jews, all found guilty, three before the Romans, all found not guilty, and yet uh, Pilate turns him over, and uh, so he's sent to be crucified. In fact, our verse this morning, we begin at Matthew 27, 35. It says, and when they had crucified him, so they've, they've put him on the cross, and so that's what we saw last time. He is laying down his life for us. He's been put on the cross. He's been mocked, beaten, and he's taken to the place called Golgotha, which is Aramaic for the place of the skull. The word Calvary is Latin for the place of the skull. And so that's where he is. Now, last time we begin to see the first of the seven statements of Christ on the cross. I want you to see what they are. And as you notice, we'll have to go to different places. The first one was, Father, forgive them. They do not know what they're doing. Today, he, this is the one for this morning. Today, you'll be with me in paradise. And also, woman, behold your son. Those are the three. We'll see two of those today. And then he's going to go on and say, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? That's in Matthew. And then I thirst in John 19. And then it is finished in John 19, 30. And then, Father, into the hands I command my spirit back to Luke. So those are the seven th statements that Jesus made on the cross. And they're all powerful. 
It's an amazing thing. On the way to the cross, he opened not his mouth like a lamb to the slaughter, and yet on the cross, he says certain things. So we saw last time, forgot, Father, forgive them. We realized that in Jesus Christ, there is forgiveness of sins. That was the first one. This, this morning, let me give you a, ba- brief, a real brief outline, but we're going to see the crucifixion and the crowd. That's what we're going to look at, 27, 35 through 43, and we're going to see the charge, what's there in the crowd, and then we're going to see the robber. We'll have to go to different places to see all these, as we've already mentioned. So let's look again at verse 35, and it says, And when they had crucified him, they divided up his garments among themselves by casting lots. Well, after they crucified Jesus. Now, we already know, and we've talked about crucifixion. We'll talk more about it a little bit later on, how horrible it was. And yet, you know, they put him there to die. And we talked last week about crucifixion that they nailed, but usually through the wrist, there's a place for your feet to push up on. And most people died in crucifixion, not by nails in the hand or the feet or anything, but just suffocation. They just wear out and they can't breathe and they, they, they die. And and I want you to notice that we see fulfillment. There's fulfillment of Scripture all the way through this. Notice it says, And when they had crucified him, they divided up his garments among themselves by casting lots. If you remember last week, I said, please go read Psalm 22. Psalm 22 was written a thousand years before Jesus was ever born. It was written by King David. And yet Psalm 22, when you read many of those verses, it's actually Jesus on the cross. And so we see right here where it says, and they divided up his garments. Well, that is, that is a fulfillment of Psalm 22. Now, by the way, usually there were four soldiers for each person that would be crucified. And what we realize from history is that <clears throat> the soldiers would be able to take whatever property, whatever that person had, whatever clothes. And so if you notice, it says, and when they had crucified him, they divided up his garments among themselves by casting lots. A normal person, and this would be Jesus would be this, they normally had four different things. They would have a headgear, like something to wear on their head. They would have an outer cloak. They'd have a girdle that was something on the inside. And then they would have sandals. And that's what they normally had. But Jesus also had what was called an inner garment. And, and listen to this. This is in uh, uh, inner garment. This is in John 19. It says, Then the soldiers, when they had crucified Jesus, took his outer garments and made four parts a part to every uh, soldier, and also a tunic. Now, the tunic was seamless. That's the inside part. It was woven in one piece. So they said to one another, let's not tear it. Let's cast lots for it to decide who it shall be. And this was to fulfill the scripture. They divided my outer garments among them, and for my clothing they cast Lots. Not only did they divide the outer part, but the inner part. That is a fulfillment of Psalm 23, 18. They divided my garments among them, and for my clothing, they cast lots. Realize, a thousand years before Jesus was ever born, David wrote that down. So they've done it. It says they, they crucified him. They divided up his garments among themselves by casting lots. There were so many prophecies fulfilled when Jesus was on the cross. And if you read Psalm 22, you're going to keep seeing more and more. Look at verse 36. It goes on to say, And sitting down, they began to keep watch over him there. See, sitting down, they began to watch. It was their job to basically had to stay there until he died. And sometimes that could be several days. Now, uh, they, they take it for granted. I mean, how many crucifixions have they done? How long have they been there? And sometimes we take the crucifixion of Jesus for granted. Because think about this. Sometimes we've heard the message so many times. We say, People say, no, well, you know, Jesus died on the cross to pay for sin. And we say it as if it's no big deal. But we don't even realize what it meant to die on the cross and to be separated. And sometimes even those we have believed in Christ, we take for granted what he has done for us. And so we never want to do that. But there they were. They're just sitting down and they're just keeping watch. And they're, in a sense, they don't really, really care. Look at verse 37. And above his head, they put up the charge against him, which read, this is Jesus, the king of the Jews. Now, the total charge, if you put all of the gospels together, is this is Jesus of Nazareth, the king of the Jews. And so sometimes they actually put the charge around their neck and it was draped around their neck. And then other times it's put back up on the cross of 
part. And the best we can tell, it was it was put up against the behind him, and it, it uh, gives the background. And it said, "This is Jesus of Nazareth, King of the Jews." This, by the way, this is the gospel. This is the the purpose of the gospel of Matthew to present Jesus as the King of the Jews. Now, it doesn't tell us here, but it tells one of the other gospels that the message was in three different languages. It went Hebrew, Latin, and Greek. It was Hebrew because that was the Jewish people, remember? And he's King of the Jews, so they wanted them to be able to read it. It was in Latin, which was the language of the law of the Roman government, and it was Greek also, which was all people. So if you look at one of the other Gospels, it tells you that the statement, this is Jesus of, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews, it was written in three different languages. Now, watch, watch this. It goes on and says, at that time, two robbers were crucified with him, one on the right and one on the left. Now, we talked about this last time. We said that there were supposed to be three robbers, one guy by the name of Barabbas, and these two guys were supposed to be put to death. But Jesus, basically, Jesus took Barabbas' place. And so Barabbas is set free, and so is Jesus and two robbers. And it says that at that time, two robbers were crucified with him, one on the right and one on the left. Now, by the way, that is prophecy as well. Look at this, Isaiah 53, 12. Therefore, I will allow him a portion with the great. He will divide the booty with the strong because he poured out himself to death and was numbered with the transgressors. This is talking about the Messiah. Yet he bore the sins of the many and interceded for the transgressions. He's numbered with the transgressors. He's numbered with the, with the robbers and with the thieves. And so he's there uh, on, the, on the cross and there's great ridicule that says, and at that time two robbers were crucified with him, one on the right and one on the left. Now he's going to be misunderstood. He was misunderstood by the crowd. He was misunderstood by the religious leaders. He was misunderstood by the thieves. I want you to think about who was there. First of all, the Sanhedrin was there. Many of the Jewish leaders were there. Uh, and then there was the Herod soldiers. There was also Pilate soldiers. There were also the Jewish people. And then there were religious leaders as well. They're all there at the cross. And we're going to find that there's somebody else at the cross. And we'll see who it is before the passage is over or before we get through this morning. But look what the crowd is doing. You remember we said they misunderstood who he is. They think he's nothing. They're going to make fun of him. Notice verse 39. And those passing by were hurling abuse at him, wagging their heads. Now, hurling abuse means saying bad things, and wagging their heads is, is moving their heads back and forth, sort of making fun. Now, by the way, if you notice, in Psalm 22, 7, it says, All who see me sneer at me, they separate with the lip. They wag the head saying. So this is another fulfillment written by King David a thousand years before Jesus was ever born. He said they're going to be doing that, and that's exactly what they were doing. Now watch what they're saying. And they were saying, you who are going to destroy the temple and rebuild it in three days, save yourself. If you're the Son of God, come down from that cross. They don't understand they said, you're going to destroy the temple and rebuild it. He was talking about himself, that he's going to die and rise again after three days. They don't understand that's the temple of his body. They don't understand that he's the Son of God. They said, if you're the Son of God, come down from the cross. The truth is this. The Son of God cannot come down from the cross. He's on the cross for us. He's dying to pay for our sins. Look at verse 41. It says, in the same way, the chief priest also along with the scribes and elders, were mocking him and saying that the word mocking, that here we see in verse 41, that is the religious leaders are mocking Jesus. And by the way, the Greek word for mocking there has this idea of little children making fun of somebody. You've seen kids go, na, 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 and they make faces and they do those kind of things. That's exactly what these religious leaders are doing to Jesus. If we could have just been there to see their faces, to see what they're doing, it says, in the same way, the chief priest also, along with the scribes and the elders, were mocking him and saying, he saved others. He cannot save himself. He is the king of Israel. Let him now come down from the cross, and we will believe in him. Let me tell you something. If he came down off the cross, they're not going to believe in him. They don't believe in him for any sign or any miracle that he's done. The last sign that he does is when he rises from the dead, and they still don't believe. And they're, they're lying to themselves when they said, if he comes down, we will believe in him. The religious leaders are making fun of him. They say he cannot save himself. That is true. He cannot save himself. If he saves himself, he will not save us. Now, he, he could save himself. He can do anything he wants to do. He, he, he's laying down his life for us. 
He's paying for our sin. So it says, he saved others. He cannot save himself. He's the king of Israel. Let him come down from the cross and we will believe in him. Now they're making fun of him. They're saying, you're the king of Israel. If you're really the king of Israel, why don't you come off the cross? If you're really doing that, the truth is this, and it's powerful, that Jesus saved others, but he can't save himself. He must die on the cross so he can save others, so he can save us. And so he is the king of the Jews. And they made the statement, he is the king of Israel. He is the king of Israel. But he's the king of Israel who cannot come down from the cross. I think about Jesus as being the prophet, priest, and king. He's the prophet who not only speaks the word of God, he is the word of God. He's the priest who offered himself as the final sacrifice for sin forever. And he's the king of kings and the Lord of lords. And in this particular place, he is the great high priest offering himself as the final sacrifice for sin. So as the king of Israel... And the great high priest, he can't come down from the cross. And so it says, he saved others. He cannot save himself. That's exactly right. He is the king of Israel. That's exactly right. Let him come down from the cross and we'll believe in him. That's not right. They wouldn't believe him if he came down. They don't believe any sign that he has done. In fact, every time they see a sign and they can't explain it, they say it's from Satan. And when they, uh, they just continually reject. Go, they go on to say, say this. He trusts in God. Let God rescue him now, if he delights in him, for he said, I'm the son of God. They said he's trusted in God, his confidence is God, and if God really is pleased in him, maybe God will come and save him. Well, we already know the father said, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. We know the father says he's already pleased in him. And so when he says he's trusted in God, let God rescue him now, if he delights in him, well, because the father delights in the son, The Son is carrying out the will of the Father, and the will of the Father is for Jesus to die and rise again, providing salvation for mankind. Whoever will believe will never perish, but have everlasting life. Boy, this is so powerful. And so in these verses, basically beginning at verse 38, 39, 40, all the way through about 43, we see them mocking him, making fun of him. Can you imagine? Now think about Jesus, who is the eternal Son of God, who is all-powerful, who who has allowed himself to be put on the cross, who is going to be the one who's going to lay down his life and take it up again, and you have these people making faces at him, saying bad things about him, making fun of him, and we would all be tempted to say, okay, wait, I'll show you. I'll, I'll come down. No, I'll get back up, but I'll come down. But He can't do that, and he doesn't do that. So watch what happens. Look at the next verse. The robbers who had been crucified with him were also insulting him with the same words. Now, when we first see him, we see the two robbers, one on the right and one on the left, and they're doing the same thing. They're making fun of him. And they're probably saying, you, if you want to say, say, you know, save us too. If you, wanna, can, if you can save yourself, why don't you save us? The robbers who had been crucified were insulting him. And so here we see the religious leaders, the people, uh, the, the Pharisees, the chief priest, the robbers, they're all making fun of Jesus. This last group is the thieves. And we realize that as you read it, if we only stopped right there at verse 44, and it says the robbers who had been crucified him were insulting him with the same words. If we only had Matthew, and this is why God didn't just give us Matthew. He gave us Matthew, Mark, Luke, And John, he gave us four books, each one presenting Jesus in a different way. Matthew is the king, Mark is the servant, Luke is man, John is God. But each one of them give more information. And so we have more information about who these robbers are and what happened especially to one of them. So let's do this. Let's turn to Luke chapter 23. Let's turn there. If you want to hold your place in Matthew and turn to Luke chapter 23, and we're going to begin basically about... Oh, 30, 30, 39 is a, is a perfect place to start, and we're going to see what happened. Look at verse 39 of Luke 23. It says, one of the criminals who was hanging there was hurling abuse at him, saying, are you not the Christ? Save yourself and us. So at this point, we see one of the criminals, and he's saying really things. He's hurling abuse. He's blaspheming. He said, are you the Christ? If you're really the Christ, if you're really the Messiah, if you're really the Son of God, why don't you save yourself and save us while you're at it? That would be a really good thing. But look what the next guy says. It basically, he's saying, if you, if you are who you say you are, then won't you save us too? But the other answered. No, there's another thief on the cross. There's another one right beside him who says, the other answered and rebuked him, said, don't you even fear God since you're under the same sentence of condemnation? He says, don't you fear God 
He says to the other criminal, the one that's going to die, and he says, look what you're saying. Look what you're doing. I think right now this robber looks at Jesus and realizes that Jesus is God and that Jesus is the Savior and Jesus is the Messiah and the King. And so he looks over at the other guy and says, who, who do you think you are? Don't you fear God? Look who this is. Didn't you have, we're under the same sentence of condemnation. We're supposed to die. And he's basically saying something like this. If he's really the son of God, don't make fun of him if he is. And he raises a question. And, and this is a question for all of us. Who is he? Who is Jesus? And for there are a lot of people who look at this, who've read the Bible, and they see Jesus, and they don't know. Is he the son of God? Is he the Messiah? Is he the king? Is he the savior? Well, the thief is saying, look at who he is. Look at who he is. And then in verse 41, he says, We are indeed suffering justly, for we're receiving what we deserve for our deeds. We're getting what we deserve because we've done wrong. We, and the best we can understand, probably they were in rebellion, robbers. They may have actually killed somebody. We know Barabbas killed somebody. We don't know what they did, but they're dying. And he says, we're suffering justly. We deserve to die because we did things that were wrong. We're receiving what we deserve for our deeds, but, Here's the contrast. But this man has done nothing wrong. He recognizes that Jesus is innocent. He recognizes that Jesus was the Lamb of God without spot or blemish. And that's when we think of Jesus. Jesus never sinned. Jesus is perfect. He is the eternal, perfect Son of God. And this man looks at him and says, we've done wrong. He's never done wrong. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God except Jesus. The thief knows who Jesus is. I want you to stop and think for a second. Here's a man that probably has been arrested and in jail for a while, and now he's on the cross suffering, and he now realizes that the one right beside him, Jesus of Nazareth, is indeed the Son of God, is indeed the King of Israel, is indeed the Savior of the world. And what does he say? Look at verse 42. And then he was saying, Jesus, remember me when you come in your kingdom. Remember me when you come in your kingdom. Now, what, that's, a, that's kind of a strange statement. We'd say, why wouldn't he just say, save me? Well, listen, you know what he's recognizing? What's Jesus being crucified for? What does the sign say? Jesus of Nazareth, King of the Jews. He recognized Jesus is the King of the Jews, that he is the King of kings and the Lord of lords. He's the one that takes the throne of, of, of the king, great King David. He's going to rule in righteousness and justice. And so he says, Jesus, don't forget me. Remember me when you come in your kingdom. He recognizes that Jesus Christ, he recognizes Jesus Christ as the King, the Messiah. He believes that he is the Savior, the King, and Messiah. And he says, when you come in your kingdom... Because he knows that Jesus is going to die, but Jesus is going to come back. Jesus is going to come back as a king, and he's going to rule in righteousness and justice. And he says, Jesus, when you come back, when you're coming, when you come in your kingdom, don't forget me. Dwight Pentecost, who used to be a professor at Dallas Seminary, said he recognizes Jesus as the promised Messiah, and he believes in him. He's basically saying, Jesus, when you're raised from the dead and you come as the king, don't forget me, let me be in the kingdom with you. Now, that's a great statement because that's one of the questions we have for all of us. Are we going to be in the kingdom? How do you get into the kingdom with Jesus Christ? It's simply by faith. It's simply believing in Jesus Christ as Savior, that he gives eternal life, that he is the king who's going to come and rule in righteousness and will spend eternity with him. This man on the cross beside Jesus recognized that Jesus is the Christ the Messiah, and the Savior of the world. And he says, don't forget me when you come in your kingdom. And you might see Jesus probably say something like, well, don't worry about it. I'll, I'll take care of you. No, that's not what Jesus says. Look what he says. Verse 43. <clears throat> this is the second statement that Jesus Christ made on the cross. And he said, truly, I say to you, today you shall be with me in paradise. Today with me in paradise. Wow. He didn't say in the future. One of these days you'll be with me. He said, today you'll be with me. Not, to, not future, but today. He'll be with Jesus Christ. And I think it's so powerful because it's not just in the future kingdom because that's what he asked him. When you come in your kingdom, don't forget me. Jesus said, it's not the future we're talking about. It's today. You will be with me today. Now, what does he mean you'll be with me in paradise? And so we could put it this way, but where is paradise? What's he talking about? Well, what we understand is 
that, and, and the best place to go is to Luke chapter 16, where it gives us the aspect. Let me, let me remind you of something. In Luke chapter 16, we find that there's a place in the heart of the earth. Sheol is the Old Testament word. Hades is the New Testament word, there's a place, which means place of the dead. There's a place in the heart of the earth in which when people, before Jesus died on the cross and paid for sin, when people died, believers went to one side, which was called Abraham's bosom, and unbelievers went to the other side. Let me just show you. It's kind of like a little drawing. And then Luke chapter chapter 16, there is uh, the rich man and the beggar, and the beggar is a believer, and he goes to Abraham's bosom, or paradise, and the rich man goes to a place called torments, that's the unbelievers, and there's a big gulf. That's in the heart of the earth. Jesus says to the thief on the cross, today you will be with me in paradise. That's the heart of the earth. See, people, a lot of people say, well, what happened to Jesus when he died on the cross? We know that his body was there, and they put his body in the tomb. But where did his soul and spirit go? Where did all that go? Well, it went to the heart of the earth. He said to the, to the, to the thief on the cross, today you'll be with me in paradise, and paradise is in the heart of the earth. How do we know that Jesus went to the heart of the earth? Well, first of all, in Matthew 12, 38 through 40, Jesus says, as Jonah was in the belly of the great fish three days and three nights, so must the Son of Man be in the where? The heart of the earth three days and three nights. Let me give you the verse, Matthew 12, 40, for just as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the great sea monster, so the Son of Man will be three days and three nights in the heart of of the earth. So paradise was in the heart of the earth. Jesus turned to the thief on the cross and says, today you'll be with me in paradise. So when Jesus died, he went and for three, basically three days and three nights, he was in the heart of the earth. We'll talk some other time about what all went on, what all did he do, but he told this man, today you'll be with me in paradise. I want you to stop and think for a second though. This is Jesus' second statement, today you'll be with me in paradise. How did the what did this thief on the cross do to get to be with Jesus in paradise? Nothing. He did no good works. In fact, he had no time to do good works. In fact, if you look at his life, it was probably bad works. He believed in Jesus Christ as Savior and King. He believed that Jesus Christ was the Messiah, the Savior that would rule Israel in the future. And he said, I want to be with you. Salvation is not by works, it's not by our goodness, it's simply faith in Jesus Christ. We get to be with Jesus when we put our faith in him, we trust in him and him alone, and we have eternal life. If any of you are listening and, and you say, well, I hope I go to heaven, listen, you can know that you have eternal life, you can know you could be with Jesus, and that is simply in the same way that the thief on the cross, that is simply by faith in Christ, believing that he will give to you eternal life. Well, that's the second statement on the cross. We've got one more in order to see it. Let's turn to John chapter 19. Let me, let me just go this way. Turn to John chapter 19, and uh, <clears throat> we'll get at verse 25, and this is where we take it up. And then remember that we don't get this in the other Gospels. John is the one that tells us this. Jesus is at the cross. The soldiers have just done these things. If you say, what things have they done? They cast lots uh, to, for his clothes. That's the third time that is listed there. But look at verse 25. Look what we see. Therefore the soldiers did these things, but standing by the cross of Jesus were his mother and his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Clephas, and Mary Magdalene. Now I want you to understand, at the cross of Jesus Christ, are women. There are at least four women. What is so amazing is three of the four women's name are Mary. First of all, there's Mary, which is the mother of Jesus. There she is. Then there is Mary's sister. Her name is Salome. She's the wife of Zebedee. And then there's Mary, who's, who's just all she's known as Mary is the wife of Clephas. And then there's the one that's sort of famous, Mary Magdalene, who Jesus had cast out seven demons from her. And so there they are at the cross is Mary, the mother of Jesus, Mary's sister, Mary, the wife of Clephas, and Mary Magdalene. So three of the four women at the cross watching Jesus all have the same name. It is Mary, and they loved him. They had followed Jesus. They, and th this goes back to Luke 2, where the prophecy to Mary was, a sword will pierce Mary's heart, and she's seeing her son, Jesus Christ down on the cross. Now look what happens. When Jesus, this is verse 26, we got to see the third statement on the cross. When Jesus saw that his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing by, 
he said to his mother, let me stop. He saw his mother, that's Mary, and the disciple whom he loved, that's John. John calls himself the disciple who Jesus loved. He saw them standing by. So at the cross is Mary and Salome and Mary and Mary Magdalene and John. And he says, when Jesus saw his mother at the disciples who he loved standing by, he said to his mother, woman, behold your son. And then he said to the disciple, behold your mother. So the one that he loved is John. And what does he say? Here's what he says. He says, woman, this is your son. John, this is your mother. Basically, what Jesus is doing is entrusting his mother to the care. John's going to take care of his mother. And we don't know how much longer she lived. We know that in Acts, in the first chapter of Acts, uh, she was there in the upper room praying with everybody, but she's not mentioned after that. We just don't know how long she lived. But it, John was entrusted by Jesus Christ to take care of Jesus' mother. Now, you could say, well, but, Je but Jesus had brothers. In fact, he had four brothers. Why didn't, why didn't one of them take care? Well, the best we can tell is none of his brothers were believers. And so Jesus wanted his mother to be with the believers who were, who were basically about ready to take the message to the world. Now, there's a tradition. I put this up here. Tradition is that John's mother was the sister of Mary. That's tradition. So some people say that's the reason. One of the reasons he entrusted her to John is because that was, that was her sister's boy. Well, I don't know. I just put that up there. That's tradition. But we do know that none of the other brothers at this point believed in him. They will. They will after the resurrection. In fact, several of them, James and Jude, are two of the brothers of Jesus, and they, they write books in the New Testament. So we see one of the great truths is that the family, family in the Bible, is not just necessarily based on physical things. It's based on spiritual. When you believe in Jesus Christ, you become a child of God, and therefore you have brothers and sisters. Well, what have we seen? We've seen three statements so far on the cross. He says, forgive them, but they don't know what they're doing. There's forgiveness. He's seen eternal life with Jesus Christ. He told the guy, today you'll be with me, not in the future, but today you'll be with me in paradise, in the heart of the earth. And then he trusts his mother to John. So we've seen a lot. And then next week, we continue to see what happens with Jesus on the cross. We're also going to see some more of the statements. In fact, next week's statement is one of the most powerful statements in the Bible. And we'll see how it fits together. Let me give you some applications. First one is, let's remember what Jesus did on the cross. Let's not forget what he did. First of all, he died to pay for all sin. So when we see Jesus dying on the cross, he's paying for our sin. John 1, 29, that uh, he's the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. First John 2, 2, he's the satisfactory payment, not for our sins only, but for the sins of the entire world. So the sin of the world is paid by Jesus on the cross. And so when Jesus is separated from the Father, and we're going to see more of that next time, he's paying for sin. So let's not forget let us, let's remember what Jesus did on the cross. He paid for sin. The second thing is this, though. Jesus offered forgiveness and life. We have seen that already on the cross. He offered forgiveness at the cross. When they were crucifying him, he said, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. So there's forgiveness. But he's also offered life because he said to the thief, today, not the future, but today, you'll be with me in paradise. That's life with Christ forever. So let's remember what Jesus did. He died to pay for sin. He offers forgiveness and eternal life. And there's a third thing, and that he offered comfort. He offered comfort because he, to Mary and John, he said, behold your mother, behold your son. And that was a comfort because he knew that the, his mother's heart was broken watching him die. Uh, she didn't know what was going to happen necessarily. And so she's entrusted there. So think about what all happened on the cross. Now, there's a second application, and I want you to think about that. Let's, let us realize that salvation is by faith in Christ, and it is not the works we do. It, there's so many confusion of people thinking that you do something to get to heaven, you repent of sins, or you give your life to Jesus, or you walk down an aisle, or you get baptized, or you try to live a good life, or you teach the Ten Commandments. The truth is this, none of those have anything to do with salvation. Salvation is a gift simply by faith alone and Christ alone. What did the thief on the cross do to have life? Absolutely nothing. He believed that Jesus was his Savior. He believed that Jesus was the King who was going to come rule in righteousness, and he said, don't forget me. When you come, remember me when you come in your kingdom and said, Jesus said, today, right now, today, you'll be with me in paradise. So realize salvation is a gift. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, it is by grace you are saved through faith and not of yourselves the gift of God, not of works, 
lest anyone should boast. So we just never want to forget that salvation is a gift. I hope and pray that every person watching has already put their faith in Jesus Christ as Savior and that they know have eternal life because they've trusted in him to give them eternal life. If for some reason you never trusted Christ, as we mentioned earlier, right where you're sitting, right where you're watching, you can put your faith in Jesus Christ. You can trust in him and him alone to give you eternal life. It is not based on your goodness, your faithfulness, your works, your service. It is a gift of God given simply 